Go ahead and turn your Bibles. That is Exodus 29. And if you could do me a favor, it's going to take a second to get there, but I want your tassels so we don't spend precious time getting there. Go ahead and put a tassel in Zechariah chapter 3. Turn your Bibles to 29. If you don't have a Bible here with you, there should be black, hardbound ones all around. If you don't own a Bible, that is our gift to you. Take it home. You don't need to tell anybody. But I want your Bible open. No matter your age or if you're a visitor or a member, have a Bible open. Go to Exodus 29 and put a tassel in Zechariah 3. So as you flip in your Bibles, um, again, on behalf of my family... Uh, thank you very much for that gift. It's, it's needed and kind and encouraging. Um, this coming May will be nine years here for me and my family. And we've had uh, moments where we had very little and, and moments where we have been in abundance at this church. And there's never been a second that my wife and I have ever felt that we weren't taken care of by this church. Um, you guys take care of me and my family uh, more than I have ever seen in ministry, and we are grateful and thankful and cannot imagine being anywhere else walking with others. So on behalf of Wendy and um, myself and children, we really, really thank you. We were sitting there singing, and, and both kids, both my boys, whispered to me, hey, is that for all of us? <laughs> and to where I graciously said, no, no, it's not, it's not for all of us, it's not. But thank you guys very much. And so um, I, I'm very aware that if, if we ever have a visitor come into the church, which we're always having, or, or maybe you're in and out, and you're in and out, and, and so you come in, and what we're doing as a church where we spend 12 months in the book of Exodus, sometimes it's hard. And so I understand if someone comes in today and they're like, hey, Hunter, um, I have not been here for 10 months, brother. I'm 29 chapters behind. I don't know what you're talking about. Or maybe you're in and out, in and out, and, and you don't exactly know what happened in the last few chapters. And so that's why it's always important to come in and, and kind of give a short brief. This is what got us here to chapter 29. So if you have slept since last Sunday, God's people are free. And so God's people are slaves no more. And so what we see after freedom and after the demise of the Egyptians and Pharaoh, God sends his people to better. He sends his people to the promised land, but there is a journey in the midst of it, right? And so what does God do? God creates order and God creates fellowship and community by doing what? Teaching them and instructing them how to live. How? By giving the people the Ten Commandments. And um, if you, like I said, if, if you have not been here for a minute or you don't know the, the idea of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments is this bird's eye view, this view from heaven about, hey, here are ten ways of living in my will. And then after the Ten Commandments, what does God do? He gives them the fine print of how to live through the Book of the Covenant. And so now where we see he has passed the Ten Commandments, he has come off the mountain, he has set up camp in the midst of them, in the tabernacle, he is living in the midst of his people, he is creating community, he is creating fellowship, and now what we see in God, he starts calling man to these great callings of ministry. And so that is what we see in God's calling of Aaron as the first high priest. And so if you need to take note of where we are, where we are going to be this morning, the idea of the message is what is heavier? What is heavier? Standing before one or standing before many? What is heavier? Standing before one or standing before many? Look at 29 Verse 1. And this is what you shall do to them to hallow them for ministering to me as priest. And so what does that word hallow mean? It literally means to make holy. It's separate. It is without blemish. That is what hallow means. So for the last two weeks where we have been, 
um, we have been speaking about the high amount of pressure and stress and burden that came along with the weight of being high priest. And so, as I said, if you've slept since last Sunday, and we've been talking about this on Wednesday night and on Sunday morning, the pressures of being high priest is the pressure was that he had to hold the prayers and the pleas and all of the cries of the people. This is a weight that man is not able or ever really called to do to hold the pressures of the world on his shoulders. And we saw that with that calling of Aaron. We see it even today. From Sunday school teachers to faithful mamas and daddies to deacons to praise team leaders to pastors, we see people in the midst of being called to do something break all the time. We see it in ministry constantly as we are all called to be missionaries. As God calls you to these heavy tasks, we see men and women break constantly. In the midst of pastor's appreciation, right now as we speak, there is a man somewhere that is standing before his church saying, I cannot do this anymore. I cannot carry it. And what I want to encourage you today, if you feel like your calling is heavy, know that it is meant to be so. Callings were never meant to be light. Callings were always meant to be heavy. They are always called to be a heavy weight on man and woman's shoulders to be dependent on God and faith. They are always meant to be heavy. But can you imagine being high priest? That is that, this is a word, if we had a title for the message, it would be called, Can You Imagine? You're going to hear it many times today, and I've already said it many times already, but can you imagine the weight? Can you imagine the needs and the stress and the pressures of that position? Can you imagine the weight of having to be holy for other people? Some of you might feel that now. You're like, Hunter, I'm always having to have my stuff together for the sake of other people. Maybe you're a mom or you're a dad or you're a child or you're a boss or you're a teacher, whatever you are. Can you imagine the stress of having to have your stuff Always together for who? For hundreds and thousands of people. There was not a day where Aaron said, hey, listen, guys, I'm not going to be in the office. I'm having a mental health day. That day did not exist for him. He always had to have his stuff together because there was a long line of people in need of prayer and pleads and health and safety. Can you imagine such a thing? Can you imagine that weight? However, in Aaron's case, that weight is lightweight compared to the weight of standing before an all-holy and perfect God. The weight of having all of those individuals coming to him about, make sure God knows, is lightweight compared to the weight of standing before a perfect and holy God. Can you imagine that? Can any of us, with me in the front of the line, can you imagine standing before God with all of your demons and all of your sorrows and all of your stresses and all of your baggage and all of your sin? Can you imagine filthy standing before an all-perfect God? Can you imagine such a thing? And so remember the tabernacle, there was two rooms, right? So there was the holy place, and then there was the most holy place. And so what Aaron would do is he would come in and do his business, get his stuff together, and then he would go into the holies of holies to where it was just him and God, and there was a veil between the two, right? And he would walk in the midst of it. Can you imagine? I kept thinking about this. Can you imagine that moment right before he entered? Can you imagine the moment where Aaron stood on one side of the curtain and he was about to enter with all of his problems and all of his stress and all the pleas and all the cries, all of his own baggage? Can you imagine the breath that was taken? (sighs) Knowing away the way that he was about to enter and stand before his creator. Can you imagine that? And so what we see in the calling of Aaron and man, standing before one is heavier than standing before many. And so we've talked about this. Can you imagine his job? Like, man, that sounds like a lot. We're past that verse. 
Now imagine the weight of standing on the sake of all people, your family and yourself in the midst of a perfect God. And what does God's word say? This is how you do it. Verse 1, and this is what you shall do to hallow them, to prepare them, to make them holy, to separate them from ministering to me as priests. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread and unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oils. You shall make them of wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and the bull and the two rams along with it. And Aaron and his sons you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting and you shall wash them with water. Then you shall take the garment, put a tunic on Aaron and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the woven band of the ephod. You shall put the turban on his head and you shall put a holy crown on the turban. And you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head, and anoint him. And then you shall bring his sons, his boys. We talked about this on Wednesday night. And you shall put tunics also on them. And you shall gird them with sashes, and Aaron and his sons, and put the hats on them as well. And the priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. So you shall consecrate Aaron's and his sons. Follow me, church. Verse 10. You shall also have the bull brought before the tabernacle of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the bull, and then you shall kill the bull before the Lord. And the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood beside the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver and two kidneys and the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull with its skin and it's awful and you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. A few more verses. Hang with me. Verse 15. You shall also take one ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram, and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it around the altar. And then you shall cut the ram into pieces, wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces and with its head. Will you highlight verse 18? And you shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. Hang with me here, church. It is a sweet aroma, an offering made by the fire to the Lord. So what does God tell Aaron, the husband, the father, the high priest, the man? He says, Aaron, make sure you look the part. Not only shall you present holy, but make sure that your family does and to make sure your lifestyle is a sweet aroma to the Lord. And so I don't know who you are in the congregation, um, what your season of life is, how many people are under your responsibility, but I can tell you this much, it is hard enough, I don't know about you, but it is hard enough to make sure that I am living faithfully. It is extremely hard to make sure other people around me are. And so there are moments where I feel like, you know what, I'm doing well, and, and my family, they are not. And there are times when my family are doing well, and there are times that their father and their husband are not. Can you imagine such a weight being put on any of us? Chad Edwards, make sure that you are ready to be holy before God. Can you imagine that weight? And hey, Chad, by the way, make sure all of your family is as well. Can you imagine such a weight? It's not just the weight of bearing the burdens of others. It's the burden of smelling faithful each and every day. You know, I'd made a joke last week about how wonderful and what a blessing soccer has been to my family. And I made this little joke that, you know, one reason that soccer has been good for us, my whole family plays, um, not my wife and I, but my kids. They don't want us out there. But one reason that I said that it was good is because, quote, parents haven't messed it up yet. And I even made the joke, I said, you know, at some point we will, but, but we haven't yet. So we came home from that sermon, and, and my wife and kids got together and said, Hunter, ah, that was a good thought, but let's speed the process up a lot this week. 
And so we had a soccer game where we tested that idea. And so we have a game for my youngest son, London. And, and so like I said, I see some of you guys out there um, on the soccer field. It's been good to us. But um, in my son's league, the, the game plan of, of many has just kind of turned into this loud scream of, get him. It's just turned into like, kick him, hit him, push him, do whatever you got to do. Get him. And I know my son. And either one or two things are going to happen. Either he's going to get hurt um, or he's going to hurt somebody. That's, that's what's going to happen. And the probability is leaning towards the right. And so we have this moment at this game where literally it's being screamed, get him. To where at some point in the midst of all of this, his father goes, hey, the game plan cannot be to hurt him. And I forgot to tell you, um, this, this referee is none other than my oldest son, okay? <laughs> Who just graciously and kindly agreed to do this. He comes to the soccer field not knowing he was going to referee, never refereed before, and someone goes, hey, buddy, someone couldn't come today. Do you mind doing this? He says, sure, I will. And I look at him, and I said, hey, man, good attitude. I love you. Good job. Ten minutes later, hey, the game plan cannot be to hurt him. And so at that moment, I don't know if you've ever felt this before, but I couldn't see my wife, but I felt her, right? <laughs> And so, like, I'm looking around, and I sense her in my peripheral, and I look at her, and my wife silently yells, stop it, right? It is pastor's appreciation, right? Stop it. My youngest daughter is over there with her, and my mother-in-law, who's very proud of me in this moment, my youngest daughter has been crying because she didn't want to come play soccer in the first place. And I'm sitting there in this moment where I've kind of barked at my son. I've shown myself to people. My wife is disappointed. My daughter is crying. And I'm looking at her, eyes off the game. And I go, Hunter, you ever felt this parent? Hunter, come on, man. This is embarrassing. Get your stuff together. And I go, okay, Hunter, pull it around. And in the meantime, um, I have forgotten that my youngest son's water is boiling. And as I turn, my son plows through someone. Because I have so wisely told him, if anybody puts their hands on you, fix it. And so in this moment... Everything is out of control. My son Liam is like, hey, I don't even know what play that was or what call. I think I'm supposed to throw you both out of the game. You know, I'm on the field and I'm like, hey, 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 everybody's looking. I grab my son. You know, parent, when you grab your son to whisper a yell and a threat, I grab him and I go, hey, good job at taking the attention away from me. Go play hard. OK, right. right. <laughs> <clears throat> But in that moment, church, we did not smell good. We did not smell good. It was one of the only moments in our family where Lennon looked at us and said, Hey, guys, we really need to think about our decision-making skills. This is not, you all are embarrassing me. You ever had a moment where you were just embarrassed that you stank? And you're like, my aroma is not good. I've embarrassed myself. I've embarrassed my family. I've embarrassed my spouse. They're embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. It's a kid's soccer game. Who cares? Well, in that moment, I cared, right? My aroma was not sweet. And so one thing that we're always called to remember is that Aaron is just a man. Aaron is not some perfect priest. He is also an irrational father. He's also a husband that's just trying to juggle all of the responsibilities in life and, and work and health and friends and marriage and kids and all of those things. And there are moments in life that we do not smell good. Can you imagine 
the responsibility of always presenting yourself holy. Can you imagine that weight? Because there are moments, guys, that I am just not ready to stand before the Lord. There are more moments than not. And so I'm reminded constantly that even in this sweet space of, like I say, our pastor's appreciation, I have failed you in character many, many, many times. I have failed my wife in character, my kids in character. I am a sinner and I am broken and I drop the ball constantly. Can you imagine the responsibility of, hey, David Evans, make sure your entire life and your family are holy and ready to stand before God when at all times. Can you imagine that way? But it's not just stress. I want you to also understand, church, it's also fear. You know, one thing that as I was reading this and I was thinking about the position, I think believers often forget how dangerous sin is. And what sin in the presence of God does, anything imperfect, anything at all. We're not talking about a bad day or a bad year or demons or baggage. We're talking about a bad thought. Anything that's not holy is deserving of one thing and one thing only, and that is wrath. Can you imagine such a weight? So in the garden, man lived holy, and he did not sin against God. But when he did, it created not only a great separation that snowballed throughout history, it also created a great danger in man. That's what sin has done. So high priest, that position of standing before the Lord, was honestly the most dangerous position on human earth. Does not care if you were a soldier does not matter who you fought. If you were a warrior in the army, it did not matter. The most dangerous position alive by far was the high priest. Jacob read us evidence of this in Exodus 28. Just look back at verse 34. Listen to this. You might not have caught it because there's so much directions and so many measurements. It all kind of sounds the same. But don't overlook it. Look at verses 34. A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe all around. So you remember the tunic. You remember what he was wearing. And you remember the robe and the breastplate. At the end of that, he had these little bitty bells, like Christmas bells, right? He wore them around his shoes and then also at the hem of his robe. And it says, And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers... And it will sound so he can be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out. Why? So that he may not die. And so one thing that many um, believers and historians feel about why he wore the bells was to make sure everyone that wasn't in um, the holy of holies and the holy place could make sure that he was still living. I can hear him. And so the bells were literally, as Aaron walked, they're like, oh, I know Aaron's alive. He's doing well today. We saw this in Leviticus when two of Aaron's sons were perished because they were not holy before the Lord. And so can you imagine this space where we have the tabernacle and I'm in there as your pastor and you go, hey, I hear Hunter. I hear Hunter. I hear Hunter. Hey, Wendy, I have not heard those bells ring in 30 minutes. I don't feel good about this. Can you imagine this? To be unholy, to be a sinner in the presence of an almighty, perfect and holy God is a matter of life and death. There's nothing more dangerous. So many of us have lost sight of the dangers of sin and how it creates dangers in our life. But not only is it about stress and not only is it a weight and not only is it fear. I also want you to know the reality of others that are in the room. And so I told you to put your tassel in Zechariah. I want you to see this beautiful story. But it's a reality and you and I need to see. Take a second, slow the moment down, turn to Zechariah chapter 3. It gets heavier. It's not just the high priest and all of the weight and all of the stress It's not just the reality that he's standing as filthy 
in the midst of an all-perfect God, there's also someone else in the room. Who else is in the room, church? Look at verse 1. This is chapter 3 in Zechariah, verse 1. And then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And who else was with him, church? And Satan standing at his right hand, doing what? To oppose him. So understand the moment, church. Sinful man stands before a perfect God. And who else is with him? It's not his family. It's not his loved ones. It's not his church. It is literally Satan, the enemy. And what is he doing? He says, I am there, and I am there for one reason only, and that is to better accuse you of why you aren't worthy of the Lord. Imagine Satan at the end of the days, and you're standing before God. Imagine Satan being in the room screaming insults of all the things that you've done in your past. Imagine such a moment. This guy? This guy? Can you hear Satan? Like, 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 say, like God, like, if I'm the only one who have been paying attention to this man's life, have you not seen the women that he has slept with, the people that he has belittled, the people he's abused, the things that he has said, the sights he has looked at, the way he has been selfish and prideful and vulgar in his life? Like, am I the only one watching things? Have you read his resume? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I'm about to stand before the Lord quiet. All your confidence about who you think you are and what you've done, that will close quickly. And now you are standing before an almighty God and you hear the yelling of the enemy about how nasty and wicked you are. All the things that you have held from your spouse and you have lied about from your friends and you have tried to tuck away and bury, they are all being exposed and you are staring at the Lord and he is hearing all of these things. This guy? This guy? Can you imagine that moment? But where is the good news, church? Look at verse 2. And the Lord said to Satan, You're right, I didn't know. And the Lord said to Satan, You make a good point. And the Lord said to Satan, You are right, he is not worthy, he is not holy. No, what does the Lord say to Satan? The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Highlight this. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments as we all are and was standing before the angel. And then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed all of your iniquities from you and you, I will clothe you with rich white robes. And I said to him, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. Man stood filthy before a perfect God. Satan throwing insults of truth in your life. And what does the Bible tell us? See, I have removed your iniquities from you, and now I will clothe you with white, rich robes. Now, here's my question that I want to ask all of you in this room. Why? Why? Was it because Joshua was holy? Was it because Joshua was worthy? Was it because Joshua comes from a good tree? He did more good in his life than bad? There was nothing that Joshua could do to save himself. So why? Simply because God's grace and love and mercy, God looks at those he calls his and says, Son, let me get you new clothes. And so for you and I today, Christ 
is not only our great mediator. He is not only our savior. He is not only our perfect high priest. Christ is also the new clothes that we wear. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Do you know what that means? This whole entire world is burning and going to hell. Do you understand me? And you go, well, what do you mean by whole world? I mean the whole world. Because of how nasty our culture is? No, 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 no. Because none of us are holy. None of us are worthy. Your pastor has never had such a phenomenal day where I said, you know what? I'm not ready most of the time if God came back, but if he came back today, I think that he would be good with who I am. No, I have never been perfect ever in my life. It is all burning and the enemy points it out. And what does God say? You're right. But anything you have told me, I have already known and I have chosen to pluck him out of the fire. And so Joshua stands there scared to death as I would be. Scared to death. And what does God the Father say? Let's get you some new clothes. Write it down. He belongs to me. He belongs to me. This guy? Yes. What has he done to deserve? Nothing. He has placed his faith and his trust in my son who came to die. He belongs to me. Last time I have you flip, go to 2 Corinthians 5. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. I'm actually going to have you flip twice. See? Not holy. Lied to you right in the moment. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. As we start to wrap up. I want you to see this. Whoever you are, you just highlight as we read. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God's word says this in verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. I like, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through what? Man's good work, his holiness, the bells at the bottom of his robe? No. Through whom? Through Jesus Christ. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, but he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are now ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Highlight 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become righteous of God in him. So this word hallow literally means to make holy. How could man ever make himself holy? Holy, And the answer is man would never be able to lift such weight. And the only way and the only answer and the only pass is that we are closed in Christ. Without Christ, an impossible task, an unbearable weight. There will be a day where 100% of you will all stand one by one before a perfect God with Satan throwing insults and your only hope is for God to say, he belongs to me. Why? Because he belongs to my son. All of us will stand like Joshua before God. All of us will have this. And your works and what you've done and what you think and what you've given and who you think that you are will not matter anything. You will never be holy the only hope we have is that God sees righteousness in us being closed by His Son. And so I told you, this is how we're going to end. We're going to read verses and pray. Go back to Exodus. 
Go back to Exodus. And starting with 19. It's a handful of verses, but man, at the very end, it just wraps it up beautifully. And I want to read it with you. And we're going to pray together. Look at verse 19. And you shall also take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands on the head of the ram. And then you shall kill the ram and take some of the blood and put it at the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of the right ear of his sons, on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood all around the altar. And you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons, and on the garments of his sons with him. And he and his garments shall be hallowed this way, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. Also you shall take the fat of the ram, the fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, the two kidneys, and the fat on them, and the right thigh, for it is the ram of the consecration." One loaf of the bread and cake made with oil, and one wafer of the breakfast of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And you shall put all of these hands on Aaron. This is what it takes. You shall put all the hands of Aaron in the hands of his sons, and you shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Verse 25. And you shall receive them back from their hands and burn them on the altar as a sweet burnt offering, as a sweet aroma before the Lord is an offering made by fire to the Lord. Then you shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord. And it shall be your portion. And from the ram of the consecration, you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering, which is waved, and the thigh of the heave offering, which is raised, of that which is for Aaron and that which is for his sons. It shall be from the children of Israel for Aaron and his sons by a statute forever. For if it, is, if it is heave offering, it shall be a heave offering from the children of Israel, from the sacrifices of their peace offering. That is their heave offering to the Lord. Hang with me, church. Verse 29. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him. So it's not just Aaron that Aaron has to think about. It's not just his family or the people. It's his boys that are coming in ministry with him and behind him. That the son who becomes priest in his place one day shall put them on for seven days when he enters the tabernacle of meeting to minister in the holy place. And you shall take the ram, the consecration, and boil his flesh in the holy place. Then Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is the basket by the door of the tabernacle of meetings. They shall eat those things in which the atonement was made for to consecrate and to sanctify them. But an outsider shall not eat them because they are not holy. And if any of the flesh of the consecration offerings or of the bread remains until morning, then you shall burn the remainder in the fire. You shall not be eating them because it is holy." Two, three more verses. Thus you shall do to Aaron and to his sons, according to all that I have commanded you, church. Seven days you shall consecrate them, remember, prepare them. And you shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. You shall cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and sanctify it. Last sentence, highlight, if you're still following me. And the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar must be holy. And so when I read that last verse and you're going through all the measurements and all of the directions, you go, man, where is the message? And all of the rams and all of the bloods and all of the verses, Hunter, where is the message in that? And it is in that last sentence that pops for me. And the altar shall be the most holy, and whatever touches the altar must be holy. And so remember about a month ago we preached that the altar still stands today. And who, what is that altar? The altar is not the altar where you sacrifice animals. The altar is the cross. And the altar still requires the only thing to touch it to be holy. And that is not something that you and I could do. We, you and I could not die for man. We could not remove sin. We could not provide forgiveness. You and I could not be the substitute. The only thing that could be sacrificed on the altar was perfection. And what is that perfection? 
That is Jesus Christ. And so we see the same message today. And so as we pray, I want to encourage you. If you sit here today and you go, Hey, Hunter, I might not be screaming at my son on a soccer field, brother, but I don't smell too good either. Hey, praise God He does. There will be a day that Jesus Christ is seen on you and He will stand before God confidently. You know why? Because He is. He is. He will not be fearful. He will not be fearful. Why? Because He is holy. And so God, when He looks at Hunley and He looks at me and He looks at you and your children, if saved, if believers, He will see the perfect sacrifice that hung on the altar and that is our Father, Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for today. As we come to a close, Lord, forgive us of our sins. Each and every day I am reminded the closer I get to understanding God's word, the closer I get to my Savior, and the closer and more aware I am of my needs because I am a sinner. The closer I get to Christ, the more in need I am for grace. In the moments of my life where I felt that I was doing just fine without Him, those were my darkest times. They were not times of my confidence and my holiness. No, no, no. They were moments that I was separated from Him. Because when I am close to the altar, I am fully aware of how dependent I am of it. And so, Lord, if anybody is in this church today and they have never heard Jesus spoken about as they have heard this morning, Lord, I pray that you step forward to your gospel, that they see your cross, that they see your word, that they hear and they see your grace and your mercy. And I pray that not only do they see you, but they see that they are in need, that I am a sinner and that I could never lift the weight that Christ so easily lifts. I could never ensure my family is holy. I could never ensure that I am ready. I could never be such a position for hundreds of thousands of people. I can barely keep myself up. That is exactly where Christ wants you. Because when we are humble, we are in need. And when we are in need, we are dependent. And when we are dependent, we receive grace. Lord, I pray that you bring us to the throne of grace this morning. If anyone here is saved, but they are drowning in all of their failures, let us worship the one who can lift them. Forgive us of our sins. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the spirit. Thank you for forgiveness. In your precious and in your holy name, the church says in harmony, amen.